everybody. Um, as we say in South Africa, Molweni. Hi, my name is um, Cleopatra Mbali Masinga. I am a graduate student from the University of Seton Hall in New Jersey. I'm doing Masters in uh, Diplomacy and International Relations. My background, I have um, an undergrad and a Masters in um, um, International Development Studies where I measured on natural resources management and climate change, gender and climate change. Uh, it's, it is such a very great honor for me to be part of this event um, that is held of the site event that is held um, in the context of the first multi-stakeholder forum on science, technology, and innovation for sustainable development goals. Um, the issues of climate change are best of heart to me. Um, I have been working in South Africa. I was one of the thematic specialists on climate change during COP17. I got that um, great opportunity and I was happy about it. So I would like to pass on to my colleague here, who will also further welcome you guys. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, bienvenue, as we say in French. Um, I'll, I'm very glad that we're all here to discuss about the youth empowerment for Agenda 2030, climate action through science, technology, and innovation. Thank you for all of you for being present here. Thank you, Miro, for putting this together. Um, I, I'm really honored to be uh, one of the co-chair of this event. And um, I would like to um, also speak uh, about the organizer, so the International Association for Advancement of Innovative Approaches to Global Challenges, IAAI. I had to repeat this about uh, for 20 times because with a French accent, the I, the A are opposite. Anyway, I managed to say it, so I'm very proud. Um, this being said, we also have the World We Want Policy and Strategy Group being present here through Rosa. And we also have the NGO Committee on Sustainable Development through Margo, which is representing them. So uh, moving forward, Cleopatra is going to tell you a little more about the aims of the side event. This event is made to answer one and tackle one question, which is what do young people need to develop their human, skill, their human potential and play a positive role? empowered through new technology in accordance to Agenda 2030 and the SDGs. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, to further proceed on, uh, the aims of this side event mainly um, for young people to unleash young, young people's potential for them to contribute to the agenda of uh, 2030 implementation and also to, ident to identify mostly the knowledge and technolo technology access needs for young people. We know that um, the young people in developing countries, um, they have a lot of, there's a high rate of unemployment. So it is very important for them to be, um, tech, to have technology access and have uh, knowledge. And also how can we achieve this through the Glocha Foundation, the Glocha Youth Centers, um, show, showcasing the mechanism for globally coordinated local technology facilitation. Um, so as it may seem clear for everyone here, young people and the youth are really uh, crucial in this process. Uh, so as they are a crucial part of this process, we need to listen to what are their needs. Um, so we have identified a few needs, uh, a few factors, a few resources that they will need to develop the future. So one is capacity building, skills development, access to technology, and finance. So. Our solution to that, and Miro's solution to that, is the Glocha Sustainable Energy Entrepreneurship Program that my dear colleague Cleopatra would present you uh, later uh, through this event. And also the purpose of this event is to look for uh, potential partners to help us to help the youth. Okay, um, we have, um, for the day we have the speakers. Um, one of the, the first speaker will be um, we have Miroslav Polta from IAI, IAAI and Glocha Foundation in New York. We've got Miss Rosa Lizard from the World We Want 2030 PSG co-chair. We have Margot, Miss Margot Lazario, who's the co-chair of, of the NGO Family and Sustainable Development in New York. We have Miss Moa Harad, who is from the major group Children and Youth Science Policy Interface um, Task Force. 
So also I would like to introduce uh, Mrs. Cleopatra Mbali Masinga from South Africa and which is part of IAAI. You see again, I had to practice another for 20 minutes about it. Um, that uh, will be uh, discussing the Glotra Sustainable Energy Entrepreneurship Program. Uh, also, we have Douglas Ragan, which is a Chief of Use and Livelihood at UN Habitat, with whom we hope to collaborate very soon at IAAI. Um, and we're going to have a video uh, of Mina Aslama Orowitz, uh, who teaches at St. John's University and who also is um, part of the Glotcha Foundation uh, based in New York and in Australia. Thank you very much, Cleopatra. Thank you very much, Tony. Welcome, everybody. Willkommen, Dobrodošli, in the languages of, uh, from Austria and Carinthia, the place where I'm coming from. So, uh, I'm here to uh, welcome you as one of the organizers of today's event and also to explain you briefly the uh, basic rationale for our work and uh, why we are doing this uh, the way we are doing it. So we have now a wonderful roadmap to a sustainable future. We have the Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development uh, Goals, and uh, we have the Paris Agreement on uh, uh, Climate Action, but the question is who will take the lead? It's really a very ambitious agenda. It will take uh, trillions of uh, dollars to implement it, it needs to be somehow owned by everybody and implemented in the everyday life of everybody. And the question is, who will do this? Uh, and the past was uh, of this uh, UN system and global challenges responses was that uh, national governments took care. But nowadays, uh, this is not enough anymore. Do you know in your uh, country really a leader who would say, yes, Agenda 2030 is dear to my heart, I will do everything to implement it. In my country, Austria, there are not many uh, leaders uh, like this. And also the uh, national ministries and uh, the public institutions are in a crisis. They don't have resources, uh, even not to solve local problems, uh, uh, how uh, even to do it uh, with the global uh, uh, problems. And so we need new approaches, and, uh, we need uh, mechanisms that connect everybody who has resources and the will to uh, help addressing global challenges, to empower these people and to uh, provide these people with the resources and uh, putting resources together that together we are successful in the Agenda 2030, in climate action and also having a good life with this. And this we do with our organization. It's the International Association for the Advancement of Innovative Approaches to Global Challenges. The name is already a mission statement. And we look uh, for global citizens as the drivers of change and the drivers of transformation. And here uh, we've experienced in the eight years that we exist that young people are especially open for this kind of topics because young people uh, care for their future, they see uh, with these uh, past patterns it's not possible, uh, we are uh, moving towards a crisis and young people are looking for opportunities and have creativity, uh, interesting knowledge, new ideas and uh, we try to help these young people to help the world. And uh, for this we have set up a Global Challenges Action Network, we have a very ambitious uh, resource mobilization uh, plans. Uh, we are talking here about the billions of euros that we uh, want to mobilize in an ecosystem that will enable young people to act as micro social entrepreneurs for sustainable development goals. And uh, Cleopatra will present you some details about uh, an initiative that uh, we have developed uh, together. Uh, over the last few weeks and uh, we have uh, very high hopes in this that uh, this will really be a resource mobilization mechanism that will help uh, the young people on the ground uh, everywhere in the world to uh, become leaders of uh, Agenda 2030 implementation. And uh, please uh, give back the floor to the moderators. Thank you very much um, to Midos for the invitation. I think it is our pleasure um, as the policy and strategy group of the world we want 
to be in partnership with IAAI and, and really with the um, project of the Global Challenges Youth Music Contest, which is an initiative that we're also partnering on. Um, let me just say that in uh, my real job is as Global Director of the Feminist Task Force. And my last name is spelled, Liz, is pronounced Lizardi, not Lizard, but that's okay. <laughs> um, that's actually how I tell people to spell it with an E. Um, and um, as the Global Director of the Feminist Task Force, obviously um, we work with um, women and girls and focusing on the centrality of uh, poverty, <coughs> uh, of gender equality to the poverty eradication agenda. Um, I also, um, and the co-chair with my fellow co-chair, Ravi Karkar of UN Women, for the policy and strategy group of the World We Want 2030. Now, let me just give you a brief description of what the policy and strategy group does and what the World We Want um, platform is. You may be more familiar with the World We Want global platform. Um, it is an online and offline platform to, um, that enables people to engage, visualize, analyze people's voices and actions on sustainable development. And it's really meant to amplify the voices of those engaging in the SDGs. The policy and strategy groups provides guidance as to the substance on the online platform, but also it provides outreach and nurturing to individuals, groups, associations, collaborations that want to highlight the work around sustainable development. And um, in this engagement, um, we are really looking at a variety of ways to engage. So when we talk about um, youth empowerment for Agenda 2030, we're really talking about the initiatives that are coming from young people and how we as the world we want can work with you to amplify that. If you're doing it, for example, in a very low-tech way, um, in just training youth for uh, learning about the Sustainable Development Goals and what they are, the World We Want platform provides an outlet for that. And currently we have um, a partner in uh, Nigeria, Divine in Kyotam, who is doing very low-tech work in training young people and kids about the Sustainable Development Goals. But it's not just teaching them what they are. Um, and he's doing this in schools and hospitals and different places. He is actually, in a sense, teaching them about empowering themselves to speak on them. And in one, uh, I can't show you because our, our, uh, we're really low tech here today. We don't have the PowerPoint, but um, hopefully we can have it in the summary of the, of the report. Um, he's shown in one of the reports that um, he's providing certificates to these young kids to authorize them that they have the right to speak on the SDGs. And that's really innovative and creative. And they're going to grow up be able to say, you know what? Um, civil society, people had input into the creation of the SDGs, as we all know. Um, very much uh, a lot of input. And we'll be able to carry it through and um, really um, um, exact from our governments um, what we need for the SDGs. On a, on a higher end, on a, on a higher tech um, and we have tools on the world we want, um, data visualization tools that people can use um, as, as just going to the site, providing in um, keywords that will visualize what is being focused on in certain reports that have been submitted around the SDGs. And this is a, a tool that um, we have available. We have the creation also of different data sets. Um, and in terms of technology, the creation of data sets is the direction that we're going. We heard from Ambassador Kamal yesterday in the opening say that um, this forum, uh, this multi-stakeholder forum on science, technology, and innovation is one of the most important 
processes, the first one after the summit, um, because of the direction it can take us, and, and I agree fully, especially in terms of uh, the creation of data, and the creation and, and looking at information on those populations, marginalized populations, that are not always um, surfacing in, in the research. Um, so I, I want to, um, in, in closing, invite um, youth, um, young people, youth groups, and leaders of young people to, to join in our work through the Policy and Strategy Group, which is the physical <coughs> space here in New York where we meet and we provide synergy in generating ideas and guidance, um, but also we can do that online. So um, let me invite everyone to, to join us um, as Miros and others here on the panel have joined us as not only members of the PSG, but really collaborators and so that we're able to highlight the work of, uh, that we need to do um, around the SDGs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Rosa Lizardi, please. Um, now we're going to hear uh, Margo Lazaro, who is a co-chair of the NGO Committee on Sustainable Development, and she's going to tell us more about what she's doing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tony, uh, Cleopatra, Miro, colleagues, and friends. Uh, I'm happy to be addressing you today uh, as a co-organizer of your side event, on behalf of the NGO Committee on Sustainable Development in New York, the International Council of Women, my colleague is here, and Global Family. Uh, last week during a, meeting here, during a meeting here at the UN for the Kazakhstan Anasta Expo 2017, I mentioned that this is a critical time in our world's history. It is also an exciting time for all of us to get involved in the solutions for the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and their 169 targets to achieve the success of the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. The focus of the meeting was on the impact of SDG 7 to ensure sustainable energy for all while making a connection with the innovative technologies and science with relation to the other 16 goals, which include ending poverty, ensuring health and well-being, education, gender equality, sustained economic growth, peaceful societies, sustained consumption, sustainable consumption, resilient infrastructures, and fostering partnerships. We all can be immediately become part of this action, the actions to empower youth through social impact projects by working in partnership with key stakeholders, including by forming intergenerational alliances. This includes working with civil society and the private sector to possibly assist local and national authorities with the development of solutions that work for all sectors of society. Through the NGO Committee on Sustainable Development, we are supporting the concept of partnership building with the, with the involvement of all stakeholders across a wide range of groups. It is essential for youth to become engaged in the implementation of the SDGs as we absolutely encourage youth to, be, to invest their talent and resources in the design and development of new technologies and science in order to move towards more cost-effective and efficient methods to improve the lives of all people while protecting the ecosystem of our planet to ensure global security. We suggest that our youth, I'm sorry, we suggest that our youth from all regions to begin to become, become familiar with the SDGs and targets by assessing which of the goals are of interest to them and their communities and cultures with the best uh, that would be best served in, in their plan of action to solve these issues. They will also need to develop, along with their concept, uh, a well-prepared, sustainable business plan through which all potential partners can visualize that their solutions will produce the best results for economic growth and sustainability in the communities that are in need. An expiring example of successful implementation of the SDGs is the Knowledge House a not-for-profit organization that was founded in 2014 in the South Bronx by two young entrepreneurs, Jolyn Rodriguez from the South Bronx and Joe Carreno from Brooklyn. They saw a need to empower youth from low-income neighborhoods to become technology entrepreneurs. 
Their intro to tech entrepreneurship is a project works based foundations program that provides students and youth with career exposure tech and entrepreneurial skills, helping them to solve community problems through the creation of tech products. The motto of the NGO Committee on Sustainable Development is turn your passions into actions for change, something we strongly believe, we believe in. The truth be told, if you don't find the solution, someone else will. And why not have that be you? We look forward to continuing our support of these initiatives and collaborating on projects with all of you. Our website is ngocsd-ny.org. And yes, this is a critical time, but it's also a very exciting one. As all of us can have a role in developing the solutions before 2030, certainly to leave no one behind, and that must include all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Marco Lazaro. Ms. Lazaro, Marco Lazaro. Thank you very much. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Well, I have learned a lot in just a few moments that if you do not find solutions, someone will. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to represent our next speaker, speaker who is Ms. Hergard. I hope I'm spelling it correctly. I'm sorry about that with my South African accent. Uh, she is the Major Group Children and Youth Science Policy Interface Task Force. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And if, yeah, it was right pronunciation. You could, you could call it mansion because that's the translation to English. Oh. <laughs> For make it even more easy. <laughs> Anyhow, so my name is Moa and uh, coming from the Science Policy Interface platform as part of the UN Major Group for Children and Youth. Uh, so part of the whole stakeholder engagement mechanism. You know, throughout the whole Agenda 2030 negotiations and now even beyond. And uh, it's a platform to engage young scientists uh, in the technical participation mechanism as well as uh, initiate uh, different in projects together in regards of young scientists' engagement uh, uh, throughout uh, science policy interface. And yeah, so we, we all have a responsibility to engage and it was also a huge interest of young scientists to to actually make their research meaningful uh, because there's so many great ideas out there uh, and there's a need now when uh, the politicians have recognized the uh, need of building the politics on or the policy on science to, to have this communication together as, as we all know. So the question I got uh, to answer today was uh, what is the critical uh, in regards of engagement and empowerment of youth in the uh, science policy interface? And uh, as mentioned by colleagues now before, is capacity building is a very important aspect. Uh, we have a young scientist here today, part of the platform, who's 15 years old. And the capacity building and the encouragement she got through an institutional, like in the education system, uh, it's a proof that it can definitely work. And she will have an approach to science policy interface, which none of us really had in regards to this. It's, it's obvious for her to buy, base a policy on science. And that this also needs to be adapted is something I think was a bit forgotten to the different settings, in different cultures, in different socioeconomic settings, etc. But something that I felt that uh, one could add in regards of respond to this question would be the equal engagement. So one should be engaged throughout all the process on an equal level, and that it should preferably also be self-led, at least when it comes to youth. Maybe not uh, if you're a minor, but the ones above uh, the age of 18 that Self-led engagement tend to give so much more in regards of uh, the capacity building aspects. And uh, the recognition is something that I started to realize now when becoming more and more engaged in the scientific community, uh, that uh, the recognition to the ones who done the work, more or less, which are basic norms, and thereby also the recognition to uh, youth when they are do, uh, contributing to uh, science. Uh, and how to do this? So I think one can incorporate the whole science policy interface throughout the whole community. Uh, there's an ongoing discussion about urbanization where I think that one can definitely uh, incorporate and address it. And something that I do think is very important in order to maintain it in the long end is the formal engagement uh, process. So make sure that there's institutional. If it's in university level in one city, if it's in the municipality in one city, or if it's in the UN level, to make sure it's institutionalized. So it will stay there beyond the driving forces which currently exist today. 
so that b brings me back a little bit to the platform which MBC Y had built. So after the adaptation of both the Agenda 2030 and the Sunday framework, etc., there were several scientists who mentioned that, but yeah, what about this SPI? Why, why, what, what happens now with this? Maybe we should build a platform, which more or less what, what we ended to do in order to have a more structured engagement mechanism. So this is part of the MDCY. And so far we have had uh, several submissions to the Global Sustainable Development Report. There have been uh, thematical discussions and even initiatives of research started together transnationally between in a holistic uh, research approach. Uh, and there is also an ongoing development of a publication of young scientists' research. And as an uh, end to my intervention here, I also want to mention that there's a side event later on today in regards to coherence between science and technology roadmaps, which is um, something that I think that the UN system is trying to recognize more and more that we need to have coherence. We don't want to duplicate work. Uh, and there is a, a roadmap which half a year ago was created in the DRR community uh, as part of the Sunday framework on DRR. Uh, and there is in other uh, aspects as well that science uh, policy interface race, for example, in UNCTAD mm -hmm. later on during the summer, etc. <coughs> and we want to have coherence between these different ones. So that's uh, uh, something I wanted to mention now to invite you all to as well, which is more technical. It's uh, at in room CR11 in the evening uh, uh, side event sessions. Oh, yeah, it's in the same room. That's really good. <laughs> so, uh, in uh, a bit other other approach, more technical and not uh, uh, engagement uh, aspects. But um, that's uh, all for me, and happy to uh, discuss further this very important topic with you all. And thanks a lot for the invitation as well. That's very much appreciated. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much, Mom. Um, so now we're going to hear uh, Cleopatra, uh, Cleopatra Mambali, Mbali Masinga, who is, is going to describe the Glocha Sustainable Energy Entrepreneurship Program that Miro funded. Please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yes, my name is Cleopatra Mbali Masinga. I am originally from South Africa, as I stated earlier. I have a background um, on um, uh, climate change and gender, um, and also natural resources management. A um, couple of weeks ago, um, Mr. Miro came to me and introduced to me um, one of um, his projects, which is um, Glocha Sustainable Energy Entrepreneur Scheme. I, I, I was very interested and I bought into it and I started helping doing a little bit of some research um, about it. This is um, a scheme which helps young women and men um, to driving the transition um, to low carbon societies in cities and local communities um, in developing countries. Um, we chose, he chose um, South Africa, not because I'm from South Africa. <laughs> But he chose South Africa to be part, to, to be part of um, uh, this project, to be part of the pilot, uh, uh, because uh, South Africa has been the country that have, has held the COP17, and uh, we want that we wanted them um, to to be part of it so that we can be able to see uh, how far they have gone, and mostly also it's because um, the, the the Green Fund um, uh, that is uh, sponsoring the programs. Uh, is sitting up with the DPSA, which is the Development Bank of South Africa. Well, the Glocha Sustainable Energy Entrepreneur um, Scheme, it's mainly to empower the youth. South Africa is challenged, really, with a lot of a high rate of unemployment when it comes to the youth. So we, we, we looked at this program as a good tool to use, that we can be able to create employment at the same time uh, giving the youth some skills and capacity building and helping them to empower themselves. But um, we can design a project, we can come up with innovative ideas of how we can help the youth, but we have to face the reality that there are some challenges um, when it comes uh, to climate change 
As we know, the world is changing each and every day. We are faced with different disasters in different geographical areas. Um, so the world, we sat down and we realized that the world needs um, to transit to a sustainable um, uh, low or to zero carbon energy systems. Um, as we know that millions um, of existing small, mediums and large energy systems are mostly based on fossil fuels. City and local community administrations, owners of um, these systems, they do not know more about the opportunities for price reductions and increased supplies um, securing coming with innovative, renewable, decentral energy systems. I would like to, um, Mr. Miro, to elaborate a little bit much further after this on the economic argument as far as the project is concerned. So we, um, this project mainly is, is uh, to create the Glotcher Centers. These Glotcher Centers will be um, around um, the South Africa. Our aims, the aim of the project is for carbon emission reduction is for skills development and job creation, is for thematic leadership leadership for South Africa. As I've stated, stated earlier, that we were fortunate enough to host one of the international events, which was COP17 in 2011, which is, I was part of. So, um, and also COP17 follow up with a replicable, globally coordinated youth economic empowerment models. And also to establish a pipeline between the Green Climate Fund and Young Sustainable Energy Entrepreneurship in South Africa. We also aim to uh, setting up local institutional and technological infrastructure for globally coordinated empowerment. Maybe you might ask yourself, well, really, Miro, what are these um, uh, Glocher centers? Um, the, the closure centers, we are hoping that the activities in the centers as more, um, it, it will be much more on um, market research, will help that young entrepreneur who has a vision of starting um, a business in renewable energy uh, with market research. It will help that young rural um, boy with a vision of being part of uh, 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 the green uh, 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 movement to uh, to help him with business model development. It will help a young uh, township girl like me with a vision, you know, to um, to identify um, the how best uh, that the, uh, uh, you you can tap on the uh, finances to support that project, that green project that you are aiming to to start. It, it, this this centers also will identify, uh, will help with identification of potential um, sustainable energy entrepreneurs. Um, uh, it, it will also help with skills development uh, because it's something else to, to to start a project, but it's very good also to have skills on really what you are doing, um, and also appropriate technology identification and facilitation, resource mobilization, uh, communication, and also communication, um, communicating global and knowledge, uh, the know-how exchange, and also the, the pilot cases of renewable energy services delivery. So this, we are very optimistic about the pro project. So the, 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 we, we are hoping and, uh, and optimistic that it will be much more embraced also in South Africa. We are trying to build a partnership with, as I've stated, with the Development Bank of South Africa because the Development Bank of South Africa is the one where the Green Fund is sitting currently. The Green Fund, as we know, it's, um, it's this unique new um, national fund that supports the Green Initiatives um, to help the youth, especially in the context of South Africa, to, uh, to, to transit to low, to low carbon um, uh, and resource efficient and climate resilient development path. Uh, so by us working with 
the Development Bank of South Africa, it will give the youth an, uh, 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 that opportunity. So we are also working, we, we are also um, trying to work to partner our partnership with the National Youth Development Agency. Fortunately, uh, or unfortunately, for a project to be um, to to work in South Africa, I I I I I I I, 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 I was telling Mira about it that we should involve NYDA, which is the, the the National Youth Development Agency, because this really is to create opportunities mainly for the youth, and also we are um, hoping to work with the cities, the municipalities. For uh, in South Africa to end to for, for the entrance to to the community, you have to enter through the province. Therefore, we have to involve the province and also the cities. And um, since I'm from Devon, and the COP17 also was held in Devon, uh, we have uh, in part partnership with the Devon uh, municipality, and also with uh, we are hoping to partner with UN Habitat. Um, currently, I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Miro, who will further elaborate more on the economical aspects um, of the uh, whole project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cleopatra. Just very briefly, what the economic logic is about this. You have certainly heard in the news that uh, the uh, cost of renewable energy technologies are going down and uh, that uh, more and more these uh, technologies and these energy systems are getting cheaper than conventional fossil energy uh, based uh, uh, technology and energy services. And uh, this uh, is going to be further uh, increase this uh, price advantage of these renewable energy services that our sustainable energy entrepreneurs uh, shall deliver through support from the Green Climate Fund, which is based in South uh, Korea. And it is uh, from uh, 2020 onwards, there will be every year available $100 billion per year from uh, financed by developed countries for activities in developing countries uh, for, to mitigate and, uh, climate change and to adapt to climate change. And uh, there, the Development Bank of South, South Africa is accredited uh, to the system, uh, one of 33 accredited organizations which can directly get money from that fund. And we really want, with this initiative, uh, develop some kind of pipeline between these 100 billions annually from the world to the young people on the ground. And uh, the, uh, if one uh, takes as an example, uh, that a conventional energy service would cost 10 cents per kilowatt hour. We say this as an example uh, with this support, international support, and also in the future with carbon offset uh, mechanisms also uh, as an additional price advantage, that this will then uh, cost 7 cents. And out of these 3 cents that are there as a profit of this uh, uh, mechanism here, there would be one cent going uh, to the customers uh, to have a better energy service at a cheaper price, one cent for the sustainable energy entrepreneurs to have a good living, and one third for capacity building on local level and on global level. So that uh, in the beginning, the uh, a center, an entrepreneur, would receive uh, funding from the global mechanism. But once uh, the business develops, uh, this local activity would feed also uh, centers and uh, entrepreneurs in other places in the world. And through this, we get the scaling effect. Uh, and uh, because uh, the key is that we need to change uh, hundreds of thousands of energy systems that are now based on fossil fuels, they need to be turned green, turned into to renewable energy systems and uh, we are confident that with this mechanism and with the partners in South Africa and entrepreneurial young people like Cleopatra, we can do it. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, that was the whole presentation. I believe we have um, um, taken a lot from it and I'm so optimistic that it will really yield very good result. As our former speakers have also stated that we all have the responsibility to engage. When Mr. Miro came to me, I took this by my right hand. I said, well, I believe this is a very good initiative. Um, so really, if you do not find the solution, someone will find the solution. Therefore, I'd like to present our next speaker, um, Ms. Uh, uh, no, Pedro 
Geras. I'm yeah. really sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I'm Pedro Piqueros and I'm a chemical and environmental engineering PhD student at the University of California, Riverside. And um, I want to thank you for the insights that you gave on the energy factor, um, and energy sector and how it affects climate change. But um, a conversation that we don't usually have is how climate change is affecting the energy sector. Uh, so we all know that climate change is happening and it's uh, largely caused because of um, fossil fuel um, usage uh, in, in, the, in the industry. Uh, and climate, interestingly enough, um, climate change affects um, all these industries by increasing challenges. And when it comes to planning uh, for the future, this is something that we need to take into account. Uh, because climate conditions are already affecting the energy production and delivery around the world. Uh, risks are expected to, to increase, and uh, this is something that private entities, academia, and the public sector need to discuss and take action as soon as possible in order to reduce them. Uh, there needs to be better assessment, forecast, and respond to potential impacts of, of, uh, of climate change. And also, we don't need to wait for this to happen. This is something that we can do currently as we plan uh, for the future and as we transition from this polluting energy sector into cleaner technologies, we can, um, we can foresee by doing a lot of studies um, how climate change is going to shape that future so we can be more productive and effective. And so r robust adaptation strategy will require accelerated private and public sector investment and there needs to be a focus on vulnerable communities and uh, creating access to information in people that don't have the access at the moment and we also need to implement low-cost actions. Uh, so at the moment, uh, you know, green energy is out of the reach for a lot of people because it's very expensive. So this will require regular dialogue and inter international collaboration as many countries are uh, facing very similar challenges, yet this discussion is, is not occurring at the moment between, between those two countries. And the youth, as you, as you were saying, the youth can play a critical role in many of the, um, these activities by facilitating scientific discovery, enhancing research, since we're all in universities, uh, development, demonstrations, and deployment, and obviously collaborating with other stakeholders that also are looking at this issue. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you, Pedro, uh, for the intervention. Uh, I also would like to emphasize the fact that um, it's a topic which is uh, very close to uh, Cleopatra at heart. Um, uh, I, and I know like it, it may seem that it's a, it's a lack of presentation or, or hesitation, but it's not at all. Again, it's a topic, topic which is extremely sensitive to her. She uh, made it uh, by herself uh, to go to study in the UK and then to come to the United States and do her master. And I would like to congratulate her on that. And um, I know, again, that this topic is close to her because this project would really enable the youth to, uh, to have access to what, at the time, uh, to be here today she didn't have access to and uh, I think it's really important and I would like to give um, a round of applause for her to be here with us today. Um, moving on, uh, is Mr. Douglas Ragan here? No, no. Uh, he, uh, if I may briefly uh, say, sure. uh, speak about please, him. Please. It's, uh, uh, Douglas Reagan is uh, the chief of the Youth and Livelihoods uh, Unit at uh, UN Habitat, based in Nairobi, and uh, he was uh, with us already in June 2014 in Klagenfurt in Austria, where we've had our conference about youth sustainable development and innovation, building the knowledge base and information and communication technology infrastructure for youth-led uh, multi-stakeholder action on sustainable development. And uh, I've uh, spoken yesterday with him about this initiative and uh, he said uh, that uh, uh, his unit will work with us on this uh, and also we are considering to putting together a side event for the Habitat 3 conference, uh, which will be in October in Quito. And, uh, uh, but he was drawn into some important meetings. Uh, perhaps he might uh, join us towards the end of the side event, but just that you know the context and they are also working with uh, the youth 
department in the president's office of uh, South Africa. So we want to uh, have our pilot actions in South Africa and uh, we're happy that we build the bridge uh, to the UN system and for uh, rapid uh, uh, replication within uh, the cities' networks globally. Thank you very much. Um, I guess because of technical issue, we won't be able to display uh, the video of uh, Mina Aslama or Witz. Um, maybe Miro, would you like to? I would. Uh, I will uh, start uh, trying. Perhaps we can hear it, uh, but uh, in case uh, the audio will not be loud enough, uh, we will have to. Uh, They cannot hear it. So we will uh, close it here, and we, you are kindly invited to uh, exactly. We will put it on our uh, uh, homepage, and uh, you can then watch it there. And we uh, better use our time for our last presentation and for the uh, interactive part. Yes. Well, thank you, and uh, I hope as part of uh, my project, the first uh, uh, women summit. Uh, we would be able to empower uh, women through technology so that we can have a group of uh, young girls during their holidays that would be helping at the UN to set um, all the technical aspects so that we can have smooth uh, or smoother presentation and smoother events. Uh, so what is the first Women Summit? Uh, it's a project that I started with my business partner, Patrice Vizio, uh, who is not here today, uh, unfortunately. Um, so it's really this the whole project is about leaving a legacy. Uh, there are many um, summit, conferences, events uh, about, about gender equality, so SDG number five, and especially about women, women empowerment. However, there are no uh, follow-up after this event, so it's a nice gathering uh, most of the time where people that share similar ideas uh, gather and meet, but there are no real, like, concrete action taken, or at least if there are, they are not uh, uh, mediatized enough. So what we are trying to do is to gather women which have been successful in life. So how, what do I mean? Women which are diplomats, uh, business owners, CEO of corporation, or who have made a difference in their uh, environment, uh, and also who are head of institution to be meeting with the youth, with the young girls. So that's why I'm here today with uh, Andrea Chavez from the Young Women Leadership School of Astoria, which is not only a school, but rather it's a network of schools which empower young girls uh, uh, in life. Um, so I, through that initiative, as I said, it will be for those leading ladies to meet the youth and define topics. First to discuss topics and then to define five topics which are going to be tackled in the next five years. So one topic for each year. And not only to tackle them from here, from New York, from the headquarters, but also to tackle it in the ground. So we're going to travel with that topic in four different locations every year. Um, and we have predefined with Andrea uh, over the, the past couple of weeks uh, three, the first three topics. Uh, so the first one would be empowering women through technology, and that's why she's here today. She's going to tell us more about the, the work she's doing with these young girls at her school and how we, Patrice and I, have interacted with them through some project of theirs. Uh, the second topic would be empowering women through entrepreneurship, and that's where um, my work is related to uh, 
Mr. Paul Zero Work, which is his project, the Glocha Sustainable Energy Entrepreneurship Program. And finally, the third topic, which we have defined, predefined so far, is empowering women through media and news. So, um, this being said, uh, many people have uh, asked me why, why me, why a man uh, fighting for uh, gender equality, fighting for uh, women empowerment. Well, the story is extremely personal. It's related to my roots. So I was born in France, uh, but my father is, it's not bad, my father is Egyptian and my mother is uh, Algerian from the Berber region of Algeria, Kabylie. And I was raised by my grandmother because my parents were uh, working really hard uh, to give us certain standards of life to my sister and I. So my grandmother is really um, a, a person I, I look up at. She is the one that gave me the value I have today. And she's a woman that uh, through the 89 years she has been living, and I hope many more to come, she has been um, fighting against many injustices. The first one being her, the fact that she were married to uh, my grandfather, more or less without her consent, so it's more or less than more. Uh, and on top of that, my grandfather like just um, took her away from a region, a native region of Kabylie, and took her to France. And since then, she never got to see her parents. And I think that's very cruel, but that's, I guess, cultural aspect, miss, uh, education uh, in some part of the world that lead to that situation. On top of that, he was extremely violent he, to her on a daily basis. Uh, my grandmother had to raise 12 children, I repeat, 12 children on her own, and not only to raise them uh, uh, by taking care, by giving them love, but also financially. My grandfather wouldn't give her anything. On top of that, uh, he had another family. I mean, like there are many, many factors that she had to fight for and she had to go through that for me um, to be here today and to fight for the woman cause and to fight for uh, the other gender is, I believe, something completely natural. And um, I, I do it for two reasons. The first one, because I want to put into light my grandmother's story, because she is such an humble person. And, and up until then, until my, since my grandfather passed away, she has never, never been remarried or seen anyone. She has always. Uh, that respect for him, which I don't know really how, but she does. Um, and I really want the world, so the second reason is I really want the world to, uh, to be less and less subject to persons like my grandfather. I want less and less women to go through what my, grandma, my grandmother went through. And um, that's the main reason. Uh, these are the two main reasons I am doing this project. Um, I am raising all the funds on my own for it, uh, and that is it. I'm sorry I got a bit emotional and a bit intense, but it's uh, something extremely important to me. So I would like to let uh, Mrs. Andrea Chavez talk about the wonderful job she's doing uh, at her school and how we are going to collaborate in the future. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I am a teacher. I was just a Spanish teacher just a couple of years ago. Um, sure. Maybe speak just a little slower. So we can sure. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I am a teacher at the Young Women's Leadership School of Astoria but I belong to the network, the Young Women's Leadership Network. We have uh, five schools in New York, others in, another, in other states, and they happen to be all girls schools, but they are public schools, and we have very high poverty in our schools. And the way that we um, tackle these problems is by, by uh, infusing innovation inside of our schools, especially technology. Um, for example, I was just a, a, a Spanish teacher a few years ago, and I became a technology teacher just to be the model that the women need today. Uh, because just like, I, I don't know, I am not a computer scientist, I am not a programmer, but I became 
one just to like show the girls that they could do it themselves. And through this work, we have been able to create apps uh, that for carbon uh, footprints. We have been able to create uh, full video games on recycling. We have created also a video game on how to eat healthy. We have also bring it to like a live show, an eco-friendly fashion show, where technology opens up the show, uh, where uh, Patrice Viciot, um he has contributed to the show too, and the power of, of women. Um, I do, we do have our own media channel, the youth media channel, and they do cover all the events. A lot of them are in technology. And uh, this year I was uh, nominated by the White House uh, as a computer science innovator. And it is because uh, technology could bring so many opportunities and I have taught these girls that they could do anything with technology. Uh, another piece of technology, like everybody, like what we like, I don't know if everybody is aware of here, we call it STEM, which is science, technology, engineer, and math. But to create more opportunities for, for youth, and for the girls, I call it STEAM, which is something now that is confusing everywhere, which is uh, the arts are inside there. And um, this year, what I did is observe which girls were the last, the, the ones that were participating the less, and it happens to be the ones that are, are most in the arts. So uh, we gathered up like a, a group of dancers and with a group of dancers, 50 girls right now are creating a digital dance, uh, which is, uh, uh, it has been like a, a, a work of like one year. We are gonna be presenting it soon in three weeks. And uh, the, it has all the technology inside. We created uh, little robots. We coded uh, spheros. We uh, created the skirts with uh, floras and arduinos, and the floras are coded to the movement uh, they, uh, we created some boxes that are coded to the sound of the of of, of the of the music. We created uh, backgrounds that are graphic design, uh, have filmmaker film effects, and uh, and the dancers help all to these. And we had no experience on any of these. So we started in September, and we started researching, and just with the with people around, we just started just asking who could help us and that's like how we got, like we have gotten here today. I think it is an, an important uh, issue. I am going to White House in two weeks to keep talking about computer science for all. And um, in this event that we are creating, uh, we think that it is very important. All these three things, technology and innovation and um, my contribute was to like create inside of this a hackathon. So how we can create positive things, to like just like positive opportunities to create like a bigger impact. Thank you very much. Well, I would like to thank you all for being here with us today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mira, for we discuss now. We have another ten minutes. Though. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, sure. Sure. I. Thought... All right. Well then. Um, now the floor is, uh, is open to questions or comments. Anyone? Yes, yes please, uh, Mrs. Uh, Lazaro. You can come to my room, it's okay. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, last week uh, we were with uh, Rachel Kite, who's the CEO of the Sustainable Energy for All, and a special representative of the Secretary General. And I just want to say, it's not all bleak. When, when Rachel came in, she told us all uh, on the panel that uh, there is a lot happening outside of this complex that is really putting, you know, you know, metal to whatever, to the pedal, whatever the terminology is. It's really happening. In the islands, there are so many technology, energy people making it happen, working with, the, working with governments. So if you're all in here and you want to get involved, get going. Just get going, come on, we want to work with you, we want to support you. There are entrepreneurs coming around here who want to support new innovative technologies. If you have something, or if you think you have partners, or you have an idea, and by the way, science and arts are always very closely associated. I know uh, 
Uh, Gloria, who's here, she's also a designer. We, you know, design is a part of a lot of it. I have a great appreciation for people who are designers of uh, amazing infrastructures that are saving cities from what's the results of climate change. So, I mean, get, it's there. And there are people doing it. It's not all bleak. You know, it's not the end of the world. And one of the, uh, one of the people that I talked about last, uh, last week also was, groups rather, was Solar Sister. They had an idea to take solar to rural areas in Africa. And they were backed. Do you know what W Power is? Check it out. W Power is the U.S. government supporting uh, uh, groups that are wanting to empower 8,000 women entrepreneurs. And let me say this too. Remember, inter intergenerational working together, uh, gender equality, it's men and women together. And it's everybody, you know, even if somebody's retired, my God, they can come up with an idea and listen, listen, listen courage and support them. Everybody has a part to play in this. So it's not bleak, it's doable, and we can get going and make it happen. And don't forget about Anasta Expo 2017. Check that out too. That's in Kazakhstan. That's happening next year. It's happening in June. It's about Find the future out, of yeah, energy. Right? Yeah. yeah, it's the future of energy. And they're building a whole complex, so it doesn't just happen one time. It's going to be three months in the summer of next year, June, July, and August. And they're going to have, they want people to come in and, uh, and work with them. And it's going to be an ongoing development, not just one year. And if I may build on this, uh, the statement of Margot, really, there's really so great potential in this crisis and in this big transformation yeah. now towards a low carbon society and uh, uh, there's really uh, our formula is globally coordinated local action because there's really so there are wonderful things on the local level but they need to be connected with a global ecosystem with a global enabling framework so that it can be replicated that it can be nourished and uh, cross fertilizing so uh, we aim to build this uh, uh, ecosystem and uh, we need the creativity, the social energy and the entrepreneurial spirit of young people uh, to make it happen and really to drive the change. And there are opportunities for everybody in this. This is really high opportunity time now also. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any, any other questions or comments? Yes. Uh, I'm listening to all of this, and the hundreds of millions of young, brilliant people you're collecting, or older people, or retired people, somehow or other you have to now catalog their real capabilities, or you're going to have all of these do-gooders, but how are you going to know who really is capable to execute? I'm listening here, and I'm just thinking, what interested me, Gloria, as a person. I found your personal story of you with your partner, who are entrepreneurs or successful, I don't know, your interesting background from the Arabic world and living in, in the West and the cultures and the culture conflicts. And I wanted to tell you that I'm so old that when I first got married at 19, this is America, my father was German, my mother Spanish. I was told, which one of the five do you want to marry? Uh, things have changed all over the world, including for your grandmother, or me, who probably could be your grandmother. So we have to now sit out. Sometimes parental advice, believe it or not, can be very helpful, very helpful. These kids who just go and pick up anyone and shack up and uh, meet this one and that one, and they're on internets, and they just grab any other human being. This is a mistake. In some cases, these kids should at last at least ask their mothers and grandmothers. I'm saying this from a woman's point of view, watching what's going on. So I think the youth have to still co cooperate with the wiser, older people in their families, friends of their families, influential people. Now, I heard this young man who's a scientist, and I found what he's saying very important, because the global changes and the changes in climate are affecting the solar industry, all the solar panels. So here I see where a younger person 
is giving me information I find extremely interesting. Now, I'm not really a designer. I come from a fashion family. I'm a media person. I'm the publisher of newspapers, magazines. I'm a journalist, and I've been, I'm the oldest correspondent at the UN, not the most active anymore, but I represent ALAF, which is one of the top Arab wire services. I have my own company, which is, and magazines, which is Society Diplomatic Review. We do special editions on heads of state. And the one thing I find, even with anything you're doing, even when you're building an editorial and publishing business, who can really write? Who can really photograph? There can be hundreds of people out there, capable and anxious, but I need to know which one can really act. So there has to be a way with all these people you're collecting. Is it radical? Is it sensible? Can they really represent my top organization I'm building as a spokesperson and call themselves an ambassador or a mini ambassador? That word is being thrown around. I'm an ambassador of what? 12 years old or 14 years old. <laughs> Let's really examine with this important purpose, who is on board, why, and are they capable to do anything? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much uh, uh, for your uh, comment and uh, uh, feedback. Thank you. I very much appreciate it. And, um, but I'm really very interested, or I wouldn't be here. I'm one of the busiest people you can ever imagine. I had to leave a staff of four sitting around doing nothing to be here. I know the project's important. I know Mira Slum is on the right track. But it's unwieldy at this point with hundreds of people involved. You have to start cataloging and qualifying. Who are these people? Thank you. Thank you very much. And just, if I, if I may just like uh, add to, to what I was saying, I would um, be uh, uh, working with a council of grandmother. I don't know if you heard of them. No. They are very active. So, because I understand that I might not have the wiseness to, uh, to, to tackle this topic, so gender equality, without the wiseness of other people like you. Uh, that we definitely contribute from we need to make Wisdom's important. That's why you have the elders. You have Kofi Annan and all these greats. All of them are in their 80s and above. You need that wisdom. And I appreciate, as a matter of fact, that Miroslav invited me to come. He certainly is aware of my age and who I am and what I am. And I'm still here with this action talking about 15 to 18 year olds. But I must tell you, these kids have to still respect their elders, and many of them are not. They're just going, why to do it? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'd like to give Mr. Muriel for the box of things. Thank you, everybody. I think it was a very productive meeting, and thank you for the partnership, for the co-organizers and the moderators. and. Uh, we are here to stay, so we will, you will hear about these initiatives, uh, not in this room, but uh, about these initiatives at the UN in the next decades uh, again and again. Thank you. Have a nice day.